Today we will cover a general introduction to 409A and a review of how to avoid common 409A pitfalls. First, let me introduce our panelists. Um, Candice was previously a managing director in the valuation group at Grant Thornton. She has over 12 years of valuation experience. Uh, Sushil is a managing director and head of valuations at Carta. She has over 20 years of valuations experience and previously held a leadership position in the valuation group at PwC. Bob has over 15 years of valuations experience and previously held leadership positions in the valuation groups at BPM and PwC. A quick review of our agenda. We're going to cover what is a 409A valuation and some history of the legislation, how to think about finding a qualified valuation provider, um, some of the audit implications of valuation, some thoughts on how to budget your time, um, some thoughts about how to decide whether or not your valuation was reasonable, and then we'll conclude with um, a quick review of why you may want to choose to work with card evaluations. But before we get started, a quick word from our lawyers. This communication is on behalf of Card Evaluations, LLC, an affiliate of eShares, Inc., DBA Carta. This communication is not to be construed as legal, financial, or tax advice and is for informational purposes only. This communication is not intended as a recommendation, offer, or solicitation for the purchase of or sale of any security. Carta does not assume any liability for reliance on the information provided herein. So, Sushil, um, we frequently get the question from clients, what is a 409A valuation and how, does, how did this regulation come into effect? Okay, um, 409A basically refers to a section in the Internal Revenue Code. The code number is 409A and it's a section of the IRS code that deals with deferred compensation. How did this come into effect? Well, basically our government took a deep look at deferred compensation plans after the Enron bankruptcy and the Enron scandal over executive compensation plans in 2000. And then the government put in a number of regulations for uh, deferred compensation plans, which went into effect in 2005. Um, and you know, Ben, in our context, uh, Section 409A applies because option grants typically used as compensation in startups is essentially deferred compensation. Employees get the options at a certain strike price and then cash out sometime later. Got it. So what is a 409A valuation exactly? Well, in our context, again, a 409A valuation sets the fair market value. The fair market value, that's a tax word. Um, a fair market value of a share of a common stock in a private company is, is what a 409A valuation is. When options are granted at its fair market value, there's no tax liability to the employee the date it's granted. And a 409A valuation basically sets that exercise price for the stock options that are given. You know, in startups, stock options are used as incentives to attract and retain talent. And these options allow employees and others to get some of the wealth created by a startup by getting an exercise price and then later cashing out in an exit event, perhaps. Excellent. Thank you, Sushil. Another question we frequently receive is from our clients is, what is safe harbor? Can you walk us through what that is? Hmm. Meaning of safe harbor. Well, safe harbor provisions in the tax world mean that if certain conditions are met, risk of tax penalties are reduced or maybe even eliminated. Um, use of some safe harbor practices creates a presumption of reasonableness with the IRS. That means in, in the case of an IRS audit, you start out with, with a presumption of reasonableness. In our context, again, in 409A context, there are a couple of safe harbor provisions um, that if followed, will, that will protect the board of directors and the senior executives of a company. One of these is who does the valuation. So a valuation done by a third party, specifically a qualified independent appraiser, uh, will help with the safe harbor provision. Another, um, one is, is a timely valuation, a valuation done that's, that's done at least once a year for an ongoing company and whenever there's a material event that changes the value of the company. 
um, typically in startups, material events referred to financing events. Great, thanks so much. Uh, another question is if, if I'm working at a new, if I'm the CEO of a new startup, when should I think about getting a 409A valuation? Well, many companies think about getting a 409A valuation as they're getting incorporated. Um, certainly, as soon as there are plans to issue equity compensation to founders or employees, it's time to get a 409A valuation. Typically, corporate attorneys can help with choosing the date of the valuation. Um, many companies do a 409A valuation even before any value is created as a strategic move because the fair market value will reflect the fact that there is no value created in the company. And, and so therefore the, the strike price will be lower at that time than sometime later. Obviously, uh, when as the company progresses and, and there's value created, a new, new valuation will be done. Perfect, thank you so much, Sashil. Assuming now that a company has decided to get a 49A valuation, um, Bob, how should a, a company think about evaluating a 49A provider? Um, thanks, Ben. So uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, you want to make sure that, um, as Sushil mentioned, uh, the appraiser is independent of the um, of the company, and typically that means is free of, of conflicts of interest. And the the four hundred ninety eight report ultimately will contain certification to that extent. But um, you know, for the purposes of of the senior executive at at this point. Um, you know, basically it means that you want a, a, a third party who's not related to the firm. And, and unfortunately, this also means that um, you won't be able to, uh, to pay for the services of the appraiser in equity, um, like a lot of startups uh, tend to do. Um, the second thing, and this is a, a bit unfortunate, is that um, there are a lot of um, uh, bodies out there that um, uh, issue credentials in, uh, in valuations. Unfortunately, there's no single body that really uh, regulates uh, the valuation profession, uh, unlike the uh, you know the bar with the legal profession or the AICPA with the uh, with the accounting profession. So uh, looking at appraisers tends to be uh, you know, akin to looking at a bowl of alphabet soup. Um, what you want to do is make sure that um, you're, you when you talk to a, a potential appraiser, make sure that they have um, extensive experience in doing valuations of of all types, but but specifically with 409A. Um, and that um, they they can point to experience in uh, ideally your uh, your company's particular industry or sector. Um, it's one thing to have you know 20 years of experience in valuing um, you know uh, you know retail establishments, but that really doesn't help you very much if you're a, a B2B software company. Um, so you want to make sure that your your appraiser understands uh, both the industry at uh, that you're in at a macro level but also the specific subsector uh, of, the, of the industry uh, that your company is competing in so that they can fully um, reflect the, the opportunities and risks of, um, uh, of your particular company. Um, you also wanna make sure that the, uh, that the appraiser has had some you know, broad experience in taking uh, valuations through the entire audit process. Uh, we can talk a little bit about um, the audit process um, uh, in a minute but taking um, valuations through the entire audit process and defending them against out, um, uh, with outside reviewers, and that uh, ultimately they will stand ready to stand uh, by you uh, throughout the entire um, audit review process. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, what is audit defensibility and why is it so important for a company's 409A? Well, First and foremost, um, I just want to point out that uh, uh, that you know valuation, um, despite what what a lot of people might think, uh, is inherently a subjective process, and that subjectivity means that those valuations are going to be subject to um, review uh, by um, outside interested parties. Those parties could range from you know accountants and auditors uh, to um, the IRS. And ultimately, if there is a successful exit for, for a company, uh, potentially regulators like the SEC. Um, that means that uh, the valuations, um, all of the, the inputs and assumptions and conclusions contained in the valuation um, need to be uh, uh, assessed and determined to be reasonable. 
um, with inputs that are that are sort of obvious. For example, uh, um, a risk-free rate of interest. Um, you know, those inputs are you know pretty much um, you know unassailable. And and if you if you get the uh, get get a risk-free interest rate from you know a, a database source, that pretty much is it because it's you know it's pretty much published in in the Wall Street Journal every day. Um, other uh, other inputs and other assumptions uh, are a little bit more subjective, and so uh, you know the auditors will do conduct certain procedures to make sure that there's reasonable support for those uh, other uh, you know important inputs and conclusions. Uh, sometimes the credibility of the appraiser certainly can help in that process, um, but ultimately, you know, you want to make sure again that the um, uh, that your appraiser uh, is uh, experienced in working with the the auditors or whoever the third party reviewer is in uh, defending um, the valuations throughout that entire process and has successfully defended their their work in the past. Um, and you know what that. Ultimately, what that means is that you're going to be able to avoid some of the penalties uh, for a bad analysis, um, which can range from, you know, financial penalties for, for certain uh, violations of, of tax rules. Uh, but I think more importantly, uh, it helps you to avoid um, the possibility of delays in getting, you know, whatever objective it is that, uh, that you want to accomplish done, whether, whether that's, you know, sending out uh, documentations for a board meeting, uh, or, uh, as I mentioned before, if, if the company is successful, uh, you know, filing for, uh, for an IPO. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bob. Once a, Candice, once a company's decided to, uh, they've selected a, a 49A valuation provider and decided to conduct the analysis, how much time should a company budget for a 49A valuation? That's a great question, Ben, and I know it's something that clients are always uh, curious about. Um, and, and the answer is it really depends a little bit on the complexity of the company. Uh, we see a lot of early stage companies, perhaps, that have raised a Series C or a Series A round of financing. Those valuations tend to be a little bit more straightforward, so they can usually be turned around in fewer than 10 business days. Um, as you have companies that are a little bit later stage, maybe they are generating material revenue, maybe they've raised a Series B round of financing, there can often be a little bit more analysis that's required, and, and that can take more in the 10 to 15 business day range. And then, of course, once you have companies that are getting close to an exit, um, maybe they have an IPO or an acquisition in the near term, um, it may take a few days longer because there's a lot more to consider in that situation and, and more analysis that needs to be done. Um, so it really does come down to complexity and how much analysis is required. Sometimes, you know, we also see companies that have specific, specific issues that um, can contribute to complexity. For example, here at Carter, we've been seeing a lot of companies in the cryptocurrency space recently that are issuing their own tokens and that can require a little bit more analysis on our part as we think through what the value of those tokens should look like. Certainly, I tend to advise clients that if you are getting within um, a month of your foreign NA expiring, or if you're getting close to closing a round of financing, you want to start thinking about your foreign NA valuation and reaching out to your provider so that they can get started. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Thinking about the process, can you walk us through what the 49A valuation process looks like? Sure, yeah. Here at Carta, it's actually um, pretty simple and a little bit faster because we have technology to support our valuations and we also host most clients' cap tables on our platform. A lot of clients also have their financials connected to our platform, so we have a lot of the data already that is typically requested um, when you're going through a 49A process. Once a, a client decides they want to get a 49A, they can log into the platform and submit a 49A request form. And that's going to um, have them fill out some, some things and provide some additional information um, that we may not have, such as financial forecasts, any updated articles of incorporation, um, and as well as respond to qualitative uh, questions as well, such as you know, uh, how long it might be until an exit. Once that form's filled out, uh, a dedicated 49A analyst will be assigned. 
and the client and the analyst will have a kickoff call. At that time, the analyst will ask a variety of questions about the company, try to understand how the company's been progressing, what the expectations for a li liquidity event are, et cetera. Once that's done, the, the valuation analysis will be conducted. The analyst may reach out with any additional questions and then deliver the report through the platform. The client can then go ahead and have a review call at that point with the analyst if they have any questions and want to get some additional understanding of the valuation report. Once that's complete, they can go ahead and immediately start issuing options through the platform. Thanks so much for that. Um, when Once a valuation is delivered, how can we think about, uh, how can a company think about determining whether or not the valuation was reasonable? Sure. Yeah, certainly, you know, everything Bob said earlier about selecting a qualified provider is very important. That, that's absolutely the first step. Then I think once you've actually got the 409 evaluation report, it's important to sort of understand the methodologies that go into the valuation. The most common methodology that we see in 409 evaluations is something called the backstop methodology. And basically what this is, is when a company's had a recent round of preferred financing, there's been a price established for the preferred stock. And that transaction can be used to solve for what values imply for the common stock. So that, that's what's termed a backstop analysis. And of course, other methodologies can be considered as well, but th that's by far the most common. And I wanna to touch on it here too, because I think that it, it can be the most difficult for clients to evaluate. There are some major assumptions that go into a backstop. Um, specifically term and volatility are very important. Um, term in the backstop is going to be how long before the company expects to reach a liquidity event. And that's going to vary based on the stage of the company, et cetera. Another thing to consider when thinking about term is are there potential near-term exits that could happen if the company isn't successful? And how can we weight those in to determine sort of a, a weighted term of, of what's most likely to happen with the company? Next, uh, volatility is something that will be considered. Typically, um, we would look to public companies in the similar industry as the company that we're evaluating and look at the volatility of their stock prices to make an estimate about what makes sense for, for the company. Finally, another input that you'll see in the valuation is something called the Discount for Lack of Marketability, or DLOM. So effectively what that is, is a discount that uh, indicates that a share of common stock is much less marketable or less saleable than a share of preferred stock because it has different rights and preferences. It, it tends to be uh, a less desirable class of equity to hold. And discounts for lack of marketability can range anywhere from as high as 50% in a really early stage company where um, there's a long term to exit uh, to as low as something like five to 10% if the company is right around the corner from an IPO. So that's just something else to think about and evaluate when you're looking at the valuation report. Excellent. Thanks so much, Candice. How can uh, a company make sure that their valuation analyst takes into consideration all of the qualitative um, information associated with their business? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's great to sort of dig into the numbers and think about all these specific assumptions, but we also really need to step back too and think about the big picture. You know, Clients really know what the story of their company is. They know what's happened over the past year. Um, and, and you need to think about big picture, does this make sense? If you had a great year, you really um, beat your forecasts and, and did really well, well, you'd expect an increase in, the, in your value. And so that should be something that's captured. On the flip side, if, if you had a tough year, if you had to pivot in your product, et cetera, and you might expect a downturn in the valuation. So certainly you want to make sure you're communicating all those qualitative factors to the analyst and making sure they're getting accounted for in the valuation. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Turning back to Sushil, um, this is uh, an area where we very frequently receive questions from clients. Um, as, a, as a sort of uh, hypothetical example, if a company has just raised a round of financing 
at say one dollar per share of uh, per preferred share, how should the company think about what the price of the common stock should be? Oh, I'll take that question because this comes up all the time. So when we do a 409A valuation, we look at each class of stock separately. You know, the preferred stock price is established usually in a highly competitive setting with management seeking to get the highest possible price for their um, uh, preferred stock. And the pre preferred stock has many benefits that the common stock does not have. The, these benefits be, include uh, being first in line to get the assets in the event of a liquidation, a big one, uh, conversion options, sometimes dividends, uh, many other benefits such as control of strategy, perhaps rights to be on the board. Um, so if a company raises funds, as you said, with preferred stock um, and, and has established a certain price, the value of the common share is in many times a small percentage of the preferred stock price because the preferred stock has many advantages that the common stock does not have. Exactly what the delta should be, uh, that is why people like us do the analytical work. In, in our practice, valuation of early stage companies is based on an analytical framework, um, a framework of methodologies um, set up by the AICPA, um, and it, it discusses the appropriate methodologies to be used uh, uh, based on the stage of company, and we use that. But the specific question on, hey, should I expect the common stock value to land in a tight range as a percent of the preferred? Should my common stock always be between 20 and 30% of that price? Well, it's not that simple. Uh, the price of the common stock is gonna vary based on the percentage of preferred, um, based on how big the capital raises relative to what, what has already been raised. Um, some specific rights and preferences, some risk characteristics, um, sometimes the stage of development. You know, something that we can say with confidence is, is as a company gets near an exit event, like say an IPO, the value of the common and the preferred will, will converge. Um, but in fact, there are no hard and fast rules on where a common stock fair market value should, should land relative to the price of preferred. There are rules of thumb out there, but they are just rules of thumb. They are not analytically derived, and so there's no uh, there's no range that we kind of depend on. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, moving to our last slide, and just to give an overview of why uh, clients may want to consider working with card evaluations. Basically, because Carta maintains the core asset required for evaluation, specifically the company cap table and the rights and preferences associated with each share class, we can provide a 409A valuation more efficiently, more accurately, and less expensively than traditional valuation providers. So that's why uh, our valuation clients tend to work with us. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining our webinar. Really appreciate your attendance. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me at ben.hanley at carta.com. Thanks again.